Hello, I'm Robert Donahue from the Environmental Learning Research Centre at Rhodes University. And at a recent uh, Fortier seminar on climate change and ethics, um, what I did is, is I presented some of the findings of the Handprint Change Collaboration and I entitled it Clarifying the Heritage Foundations of an Ethic of Care for ESDS Handprint Learning Actions in School Curriculum Settings. Drawing on the Handprint Care Teacher Handbook that was developed through collaboration with colleagues in Mexico, Germany and India. And this was centered on um, curriculum-based handprint learning that activates a love of self others and surroundings, as is reflected in these lovely pictures of children working together to learn. Now, we were centered on exploring the heritage foundations of an ethic of care in this work and in the presentation. What I do is I start with the Southern African context of high um, seasonal climate variability through the El Nino Southern Oscillation, um, what's happening at the moment, and then looking at climate and vegetation to explore agroecological cultural landscapes and to clarify ethics led action learning that disrupts the colonial nature culture dialectic that opposes people and nature and um, recovers heritage for ethics led learning in classroom settings. And this means exploring some of the cultural processes that shaped living landscapes in Southern Africa. And looking at these heritage landscapes, we explore the Uhu Galesha of the Tosa, the Tonga um, in relation to fish harvesting and um, sustainability on the um, East Coast. And then we look at agroecologies of early stone um, settlements, um, the Moyombo woodland, and the cultural ecology of the Hlabisa grassland. And throughout this, we are looking at methods in which heritage activated learning task sequences can develop, working with Anne Edwards' um, four quadrant uh, model for planning um, learning. So how in our handprint change research, and how is this informing um, heritage activated and ethics led learning in Southern African curriculum settings of ESD is the major question that I was trying to address. And this had me surface some of the um, nexuses of uh, tension and change in, in colonial modernity, one of which is a move from community to individual in schooling, um, the people dialectic um, with nature, um, you know, people as destroyers of nature, and then looking at the ethical processes of learning to make choices and principles, the guiding principles. And the question I asked here is, how can we find some sort of middle ground here in education for sustainable development towards knowledge with a practical coherence that works in everyday life and that is consistent with the ethical solidarities of sustainable living for learning to transition to more just and sustainable futures together? And that led to the question, how can Indigenous ethical processes and heritage inform learning for sustainable futures. Now, if we start um, looking at the climate picture and with a simplified vegetation map of the summer season climatic processes, the intertropical convergence zone moves south um, with the uh, sun to bring rain in Central Africa. We have the influence of the Southern Indian Ocean cyclonic system um, we have the Southern Ocean frontal systems, um, and we have the cold current. Um, so the Southern Africa is an area of climate extremes because of these interacting um, systems, leading to high climate variability. And the access program of the CSR has recently um, informed us that the um, extreme state of ENSO the um, El Nino Southern Oscillation is known to impact global weather now. This is quite conclusive. And if we look at it, here is the Enzo of the El Nino extremes. And 
Um, the seasonal climate in southern Africa responds to this signal, with generally warmer and drier conditions associated with the El Nino state and cooler, wetter conditions with the La Nina state. So the El Ninos have in the past been associated with record heat and drought in the summer rainfall region, while the La Ninos have been associated with flooding. And now the researchers looking at this year have indicated that through regular monitoring of this El Nino Southern Oscillation System, that it suggests that a strong El Nino is currently developing in 2023. This comes on top of reports of unprecedented global sea surface temperatures and continuously rising average atmospheric temperatures that are associated with the climate change in the area. Um, should this El Nino manifest as projected, we should expect that this will have significant impact on the coming summing, summer climate and weather in southern Africa. So we live in an area of climate extremes, and if we look at sustainable landscapes, how these developed, um, because the climate extremes have existed in the past as well. So landscape change was a slow process, and early migrations have been described in the folklore as the taming of the land through the work um, that has been recently done on genealogies. So heritage practices of shifting agriculture and pasture management with fire expanded the grasslands, providing more fodder for cattle and wild animals, as well as pushing out the habitats of the tsetse fly. And if we look at a model of this, we're looking at the village processes, what one can find is that the um, imifino gathering, fire, hunting and grazing produces landscape change to constitute a taming of the land and the production of um, agroecology, um, agroecological cultural landscapes or living landscapes for people. Today, it's still possible to read the landscapes of Southern Africa as an outcome of the interactions of people and climate shaping Southern African landscapes. Um, this developed over centuries of successive migrations um, where indigenous peoples created living landscapes. Early cattle people, the Nguni, developed upland home ranges and cattle pastures that spilled over and expanded into the lower areas where wildlife herds began to proliferate as human seasonal burning opened up woodlands into the vast savanna grasslands of southern Africa, where people appeared to be surrounded by an Eden of wildlife to the colonial mindset. Um, now, if we look at a snapshot of these social processes of moral orientation and land care ethics that developed alongside these cultural processes. If we look at it from a Western perspective to start with, well, Western ethics as character from the Greek ethos emerged and evolved within cultural processes of long durée as embedded moral dispositions for guiding our actions. Over time, sociocultural processes of struggle shaped developing cultural solidarities in relation to what is right, good and proper in diverse human intergenerational settings. And these processes shaped social dispositions that emerged within intergenerational life experiences in community with others. Now, if we take Hunu Ubuntu as an example, then we are looking at um, a deep-seated um, ethical process um, that had a processual character so the processual mental and physical dispositions in an individual characterized by um, humility, kindness, courtesy, warmth, empathy, understanding, respectfulness, friendliness, responsibleness, and consideration, which manifests itself, among others, in the pattern, in the manner of talk and walk and behavior, the way we dress and interact with relatives and non-relatives alike. Now, this is a definition that I got off the internet, and I particularly selected it because it indicated to me how the concept of Ubuntu had developed from a social solidarity and a together process now into an individual process. So our living landscapes, heritage, and an ethic of care can guide handprint action learning as stewardship of shared surroundings. And this was the disposition that we started to work on and look at from a um, embedded ethics in intergenerational orientating codes. 
Now, from a Western perspective, again, Foucault traces how ethic-orientated moralities in early Christian states in the West transitioned into code-orientated moralities in early nation-states and modernity. And of course, these ethical codes of conduct were what were deployed in colonial education, and they contrast with the processual processes of indigenous ethics. They are implicit in the modern education project and have been expanded into ESD as a moral imperative to educate for sustainable for sustainability. This is currently a global moral imperative that developed around a nature culture dialectic that people are destroying the world that can be traced back to the natural sciences and Western imperialism. Of course, there's data to support this, but bringing problems to children is not the best way of engaging them, we are finding in our research. So drawing on these positioning perspectives around ethics and landscape, I probe how the ethics education emanating from the colonial era excluded heritage practices and muted African processes of deliberative ethics, ethical solidarity for a common good. And this deliberative ethical solidarity um, for a common good is what is central for ESD and classroom settings. So if we move into the classroom now and we look at normative ethics, in his recent work on resonance-seeking imperatives within modernity, Rosa notes how within the sharing of stories, our mirror neurons and language establish the preconditions that allow the complex processes of adapting, adopting other perspectives, thus engendering the intersubjective social phenomenon of narrative empathy. So if we look at narratives in classroom and narrative empathy in schooling, Nell Nodding suggests that empathy, which can emerge as a spontaneous process and mediated narrative ethic of care for the other, is both cognitive, in other words, it involves knowledge and the acquisition of knowledge to guide ethics, and also emotional feelings being for the other. So flowing from this, a handprint approach to ESD in Southern African settings was clarified as co-engaged ethical processes of deliberative meaning-making, Uno Ubuntu, towards knowledge-informed solidarities that enable shared action towards resolving concerns for a common good. And um, this really came to light in uh, my colleague uh, John's work recently. He's just completed his PhD. And he talks about a love of Africa and a love of being African. And if we look at the cultural landscape perspective, what one has is the foundations of this love at a landscape level. And it's notable that here moral imperatives of love and respect can be expanded to include the wider than human within a shared duty to activate change for a common good as a foundation for ESD. And now um, drawing on some recent work um, in, in the Stockholm Resilience Center and with Cape Town, looking at it from a living landscape perspective, one finds that care is critically important here, along with knowledge and agency, the capacity to do things. And what they did is they looked at care and knowledge and said this contributes to vision, and they looked at care and ethics, and this contributes to agency and the activation around moral imperatives. So that we were able to then see Handprint as change projects that emerge from ethics-led learning um, as a land care process of stewardship, of land stewardship, based on a land ethic. So ESD, as a living landscape um, stewardship, was implicit in African um, perspectives, and we were able to take it up into um, handprint pedagogies around story sharing, um, the exploration of knowledge to find out more, the development of agency to work things out in a handprint process, and also the taking of action to do something through change projects. So if we look at the care element coming out in the stories, then we look at the knowledge element in the finding out, 
We look at the agency that develops through learner-led work. And then, of course, the change project being critically important for the pulling of all of these ethical processes together. Now, an interesting um, synthesis here is that individual action is creative in the sense that when I enact care for the other through a process like, like this, I strengthen the tissue of interpersonal solidarity in which ethical behavior resides. And um, if this interpersonal solidarity, if we look at it in terms of ESD, is rebuilt, it may eventually make possible active citizenship within a reconstituted public sphere. So in other words, we are able to relate it to Africa and we are able to relate it to ESD processes. Now if we come back to our map, where we are looking at perhaps a decolonial reframing of this nature culture um, problem presentation approach to uncover and recover the ethical foundations of early indigenous land care practices around the intertropical convergence zone, the southern Indian Ocean and the southern ocean, as well as the cold current and the Botswana high pressure, producing a subcontinent of very, very high climate variability. Some say the highest climate variability anywhere on Earth that is likely to be subjected to um, global um, climate change in severe ways. Now, if we take the taming of the land processes that developed, and we look at particular sites and particular landscapes, we look at the Nyanga area, we look at the Bokoni, um, both stone settlements, early um, pre-colonial stone settlements. Then we look at the pre-colonial work in the Moyombo. Um, we look at the um, Zululand grasslands in Slabisa, and we look at the Orza homeland grasslands um, in the Eastern Cape. What we're able to see is how the cultural processes have shaped landscapes of agroecological um, cultural sustainability, and that these have been produced through the activities of people to create living landscapes. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is, can we now create living landscapes in the future, given what modernity has brought to Southern Africa in terms of land deg degradation, and of course the risk of um, climate extremes in, in increasing. Now, if we take this into climate smart um, cultural landscapes of Southern Africa as an ancient creation of indigenous people and look at the Eastern Cape, we can immediately see that we now know that the El Nino Southern Oscillation is able to produce these extremes. And we now know that people have produced living landscapes that are now disrupted through um, the, into the modern era. And we also have um, archaeological evidence of early agroecologies that we can draw on. Now, um, if we take an example of cultural adaptation to these climate extremes, and we look at Orion's belt arising at, in the winter, um, early winter of um, the Eastern Cape, the Tosa historically would Ukugalesha to bring moisture into the soil so that it was ready for the summer season and also to bring um, fertilization through the cattle. There would also be drought season migrations and of course people had ways of looking after the living water in the area as well. And the question that one we are able to begin to raise out of this cultural framing of um, climatics is how do we plan together for high climate variability in the future? And this wonderful picture of a Tosa landscape in the Eastern Cape is a, a, a landscape that is loved by the Tosa people. It came about through the shaping processes. And when one contrasts it with the historical climate map, you can see that it is a modified landscape, but a sustainably modified landscape where the upland forests and the coastal forests have diminished to produce the grassland that supported people and wildlife in the region. And um, if we take this into an education setting around 
the rainwater harvesting practices, it's possible to show how the Uhu Galesha, um, the Kosa experienced cycles of drought in the area, cattle people have harvested imifuno and grown vegetables in the household gardens, each winter season as Orion's belt became visible in the night sky, they would put cattle into the fields before breaking ground, Uhu Galesha, in preparation for the spring rains. Seasonal climate variation did not enable them to predict the spring rains each year, and Uku Galesha captured winter rainfall to aid ploughing and enable crop generation, germination. So what we're able to do is we're able to look at climate change out of cultural history in terms of soil moisture. And of course, we don't grow vegetables today in most households, and in many households are only now going back to considering the capturing of water. So we can ask, what does this mean to us today? How are these things today? Do we need rainwater tanks? Should we be watering with hose pipes? Should we be watering with um, uh, the watering cans? And what can we do to uh, make things more sustainable together? So if we jump into another cultural landscape of the um, Tonga in Cozy Bay, then we see similar landscape change through the cultural process of land shaping. And there's um, uh, work that is being done by Tami in relation to um, the fish trapping, which is over seven year, 700 years old. And we could do an exploration of this as well. If we look back at ancient history of the um, Nyanga area, over 5,000 square kilometers of terracing cultural landscape here, um, which changed the upland forests and um, savanna, and was able to, through the taming of the land, to produce this cultural landscape that we now see ancient evidence of, from the Kalinga, the masters of water, and again, one can develop a, a learning process out of this onto the Makovisi, a part of the Moyombo woodland. Again, the woodland savanna modified. So you've got the wonderful grasses underneath the trees in the summer, providing shade. In the winter, the leaves are lost um, and the animals are able to move out into the grasslands and down into the lower areas as the um, tsetse fly receded. Again, a cultural landscape of change that is a living landscape for us to work from. And Titch Pess and I and I developed some materials that can be used from story to tuning in, finding out in the conditions today, working things out and taking action. Um, now up to Tlabisa and the Nguni Upland um, cultural landscape. I found this as a free picture on the internet and it just it, it was invigorating for me to see the animals um, running with people, hunting reedbuck perhaps. And again, a modified landscape, but modified into a living landscape through the cultural processes. And here again, the story is from Magema Fuse's diaries and um, in terms of um, cholera today, um, one's able to look at sustainability through this type of activity. Now, all of these materials, as I said earlier, came out of the handprint um, collaboration that was convened by the Center for Environmental Education in India, and we worked with Mexico and German colleagues to produce this, along with um, Japan, Norway, Malaysia, and um, providing input um, and guiding some of the work that we were doing. Now, all of this work was activated through the initiative of Indigenous scholars working in teacher education, and um, I list them here um, as um, the people who produce this knowledge in community settings. And I need to, to um, emphasize that all of the materials that I'm showing you are merely exemplars as starting points for lesson planning in curriculum settings. Heritage narratives cannot reflect the nuance and diversity that comes with situated IK work in mother tongue. So narratives should be read as seeds 
for work towards more inclusive learning mediated by those engaged in and with memories of sustainable heritage practices for informing deliberative learning towards more just and sustainable futures. And part of the editorial team was important for guiding this material that's now up on the um, EnviroLearn website for open access. So if we try to pull this stuff together around the Anne Edwards um, story sharing, finding out, working out and taking action or taking action to find out, um, story sharing to work things out. The important thing is that our ethical patterns of knowing, feeling and doing emerge around cognitive dis dispositions. In other words, knowledge informed dispositions and volitional agency, what we choose to do because of how we feel about things. And Nell Noddings was very useful here as a practical starting point for considering ethics as both cognitive, in other words, involving knowledge, and emotional, involving feelings. And what she does is she says that modeling is really important in startup to mediate learn, learning transactions. And then dialogue, a dialogical approach to learning is critically important for the agency of the learners to come in. And then practice. Lots of activities where the students are able to consider and contemplate ethical processes. And then confirmation or affirmation through the learning, what they're learning to know, and how things feel and work together. So I found this very, very useful, along with John's work on ethics of Afrophilic modeling, to look at in our story sharing, what we're doing is we're moving into dialogue and practice to find out more and to work things out together. And then we're moving into action taking, where we are able to affirm actions within the classroom as a center of caring relations. So this is what we came up with as a tool for teachers to think about ethics in their classroom settings. Now, what about the learning? Heritage Activated Learning Towards More Just and Sustainable Futures, drawing on the work that Chikamore did on um, a transformative model of ESD, Ingrid Schudel's model also working on uh, with critical realism, and of course the Vygotskyan cultural um, model of learning um, of a double stimulation. We have to be very careful that we don't just start with present problems as contradictions and then jump into the future. Because without the past, what we're not able to do is to draw on heritage, life experience and ethical questions so that we're able to understand how the past has produced the matters of concern in the present. And this is a critical foundation for ESD in classroom settings, where in our learning transactions, there might be a first stimulation around a contradiction or a problem or a challenge, and then a second stimulation of the heritage practices and life experiences activated as mediating tools. Or this could be the first stimulation that then comes into the contradictions. For knowledge-based ethical thinking, ascending from the abstract, in other words, the feelings and ideas and knowledge or the concepts into the concrete, into practice, through a process of learning. On handprint learning pathways, um, of ethics-led volitional action. And the four-quadrant framework is ideal for this, where you can start off with real-world heritage, a story that exemplifies and raises ethical questions. Then you can look at formative inquiry in quadrant two and quadrant three, which open things up towards change projects that can be initiated and deliberated um, in a classroom setting. So if we're looking at handprint learning now and we're trying to pull this whole process together around cultural landscapes and the importance of love of the land, then we have got in Southern Africa living landscapes of uh, care. And in our classroom settings, we need to look at these um, historical landscapes of, chair, of, Claire, of care and the challenges that we have today, and emphasize knowledge and agency so that 
The shared visions come out as we surface knowledge and life experience, as well as knowledge out of history. And then we're able to look at shared ethics, so that when we start planning our lessons around story sharing with a startup story, um, then Quadrant One sort of kicks off the ethical imperative, and we're able to then find out with a purpose um, and acquire the necessary knowledge for this. And then we're able to work out and develop the agency towards um, taking up ESD in productive ways. And then some sort of action taking as um, change projects, handprint change projects for land care stewardship, looking after the land, looking after each other towards more just and sustainable futures. So this is the work that we've started to put up on the handprint um, learning platform, thanks to the work um, that has been done at uh, the Environmental Learning um, Research Center, particularly by Wilma van Staden. And there she's put up um, these um, uh, ways of accessing the material online by just doing a snap scan. And at the moment, we're building um, six uh, main areas of um, images and startup stories and ideas that teachers can draw from. Climate Smart Heritage, Heritage Food Gardens, Health and Nutrition, Biodiversity, the Marine and Coastal, which includes the um, Tonga, and of course the Water and River Health, which includes the Mini SAS. So all of these are intended to be starting points for heritage activated learning approach to ESD in Southern African settings, so that we're able to really work out of understanding the environment around us, our living landscapes, and moving towards um, the ethical imperative of um, more just and sustainable futures using a handprint approach.